So good morning to you all. Um, you got exercise 108's handout, but the back is not for you. It went on the wrong one. So you can completely ignore the back. You only deal with the front. I apologize. That was one of those copy machine. I was fighting it this morning. It didn't do what I wanted it to do. But anyway, you can ignore that. And today we're going to do some actual collage work in Photoshop. And so we'll take images and put them together and try to make them believable if we can. And this is something that I used to save toward the end of the semester. And I found that if we do this as a smaller chunk, when we get to the end of the semester and we're doing collage work, you don't have to worry so much about it because you've already done it once. So uh, today we're going to take people that you cut out yesterday or on Monday, and we're going to stick them into a scene and make them be believable that they can actually be in the scene. And I'm going to talk about how you go about uh, analyzing the scene and then consequently making it so that these people feel like they're part of the scene. Um, today, I, you're, you're welcome as part of this to choose one of your own images. But I have a list of images at the bottom of exercise 108 here. Um, you're going to be picking one city street and one landscape to be inserting the people into. So you're going to do this twice in two different contexts. The reason that we do it in two different contexts is because it's a lot easier to put somebody on a, a paved surface and to create their shadow than it is on a grassy field. And so we'll, we'll practice both. Uh, I have a bunch of examples here. And you can, I'll open these so that we can scroll through them really quick. Any one of them would work just fine. Uh, you can see that I've, I've set up these kind of loaded street scenes that you can work from. This will be the one that I practice with today, uh, which of course you're welcome to, to work with that scene. But any one of these would be fine. You could also pick any other empty street scene. I ask that you create something that's, that's empty or mostly empty. Obviously, this has a few cars in it. Um, this has one person sitting there. But we want something mostly em empty because obviously we're going to put people into the scene. So if it starts empty, that's a good thing. Uh, and then when it comes time to pick the landscapes, I have a variety of landscapes to pick from. Um, again, they're all Flickr images. We'll see if it loads. Yeah, there you go. And we'll talk through you know, what makes these scenes work and, and kind of analyze those scenes, et cetera. So let's go ahead and I'm going to open up the first scene here. Let me start with opening Photoshop, if I can find it. And then I'll go ahead and open up that first scene. And let me do that scene. Wait, that is. There it is. And I'm going to do a little bit of drawing on top of the scene just to kind of be able to illustrate some stuff um, to you. So bear with me for just a second while I set this up so that I can draw in red and you guys can see it. So as we, as we start to look at this scene, it is, in, and if you remember back to 1.30, maybe you talked a little bit about perspective. If it were up to me, the 1.30 class would definitely cover perspective, but it doesn't always get there. Um, but if we look at an image like this, essentially what we're looking at is a one-point perspective. Everything in the scene vanishes toward a point that's right about here in the center. And so if I, for example, were to connect all of these light posts together with a line, they would ultimately end up falling to the vanishing point. Likewise, this edge of the street, if the street didn't curve away, would essentially fall toward the same vanishing point right there in the center. Likewise, this would as well. So we can kind of see that that's the, the general makeup of the scene. That also tells us that running across right about here is something called the horizon line in the image. And so that's the line, if we, if we had nothing in the scene and we were standing on the beach and we looked out at the ocean, there's a point at which the curvature of the Earth goes away from us and we get a horizon. Essentially, that's the point that we're trying to identify or that's the line that we're trying to identify. I'm going to drag a guide down that represents that, that point. And I'll do that by dragging from the rulers. And if your rulers aren't showing, I, you can turn them on by going to View and then checking rulers to show the rulers at the top of the page. And then you can drag from the rulers down. And you want to create a guide 
that's right at about where we think the horizon line is, something like that. And it's always good when we first start looking at a scene to identify where this horizon line is, because when we place images in, they're going to be relative to that line. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my red shapes here for a second. And so I've identified where this horizon line is. The guide's going to sit there as a reference point for me. The other thing that I'm looking at as part of this scene is, OK, let's analyze it from a sunned perspective. Where is the sun in this scene? OK, it's behind me, and it's up and to the right. And so we see the shadows being cast from the sun that's behind us and up and to the right, cast down. So for example, this point right here, this edge of the building there, casts that shadow to right there. So we've just learned the angle of the sun with that little line. Furthermore, we have an understanding of where the angle on the ground is by this line, which is one of the light posts that's off the scene way over here. But we can use this as a bit of a guide as well. So we have this in terms of how the sun's casting down, and this line in terms of what angle it is away from us. If I were to put those two together, roughly like that, we can get essentially the sun and where it is in our perspective behind us. Does that kind of make sense? So you don't have to draw these. And as you do more and more of these uh, collages, you can just kind of see where the sun belongs and where the shadows belong and what feels right. But I wanted to draw that so that you could kind of see it. Let's analyze another picture. Um, and then we'll come back to dropping the people into the scene. Because I think this, this process is definitely important. Let me see. Here's another street scene. So in this scene, we're looking at the same kinds of things. So if I were to draw a line along this kind of second floor here, we'd end up seeing where that vanishing point is. You guys can see the red line, yeah? This coming up here is kind of going to that. Notice that there's some stairs in here. So it's not a perfect science. We're looking for an approximation. Likewise, these walls curve a little bit. So if I were to draw a line here, it wouldn't match up. But that's because they're facing us. It's not a true perspective. It's, it's curving around. It would be better drawing a line you know, along this level, et cetera. So somewhere in that point is our dead center. And I would say eye level in this scene for the horizon line would be right about there. That seems about right. So I'll go ahead and turn off these shapes. And I'll drop down, using my rulers, a guide that goes right across where I believe the horizon line to be. So again, first thing I do is I establish where that horizon line is. The next thing is I need to look at what's happening in terms of casting shadows. And here, I don't, because it's kind of an alley, if I look back in here, there's not really anything for me to see that's casting a shadow. But I can look, oops, hold on a second. I can look right here. This piece is casting a shadow down on the wall right there. So I can still get the angle of the sun. Let me turn these, that off again. And now I could draw a line from here to there of that little light fixture there. Actually, sorry, it would be the bottom of the light fixture cast to the bottom of the light fixture, like that. So I'm now getting the angle. And I can use that angle later on. Getting the, the side angles a little harder, I'm going to use this little piece. I'm assuming that that is vertical right there, that edge of the building. So you can say, OK, that's that. And if I were to put these two pieces together, we get essentially the angle of the sun. So the same thing that I was doing. It's up and to the right, but it's a little bit flatter to the scene as opposed to being further behind me. Okay, So I'm trying to analyze these scenes to see where the sun is. Let's do a nature scene. All right, so here's one. We have the open field. So this time, we have less good information, but we still can tell that the sun is on the right. We can look down here. There's our shadow. And so I'll draw those lines in just a second. When it comes to the horizon line, there aren't any city streets. There's nothing to kind of find the vanishing point. And the other thing that tends to happen in a landscape is we have a hill. It goes up. It goes down. It goes to the side. So it's a little bit more of an approximation. 
we have some understanding based on where this meadow is that somewhere probably right about there is going to be the horizon line. It's a little bit more of a guess in a nature scene. If I were to open another one, here's another example. We get a little bit of a horizon for where that edge of the meadow is. Chances are it's going to be slightly higher than that. Oops, sorry. Chances are it's going to be slightly higher than that, probably right about there. And that's coming more from experience than being able to, to do vanishing points. And so that's why I encourage you to start with the streetscape, because it's easier to use the built objects to, to identify where that point is. And I'll, again, I'll show you why this vanishing point is important um, in just a second. So in terms of analyzing the shadows, let me jump back to that first nature one. There it is. So I have my horizon line. I have a tree that's cast a shadow here. So once again, I can use my angles. I could go from the top of the tree to right there. And I also get a sense for where the bottom of the tree is, and it's like that. So in this case, the shadow or the sun is slightly in front of me in this scene, shining back. If I look at this scene, there's almost no objects that I can really use in this scene to, to show where the cast is. Uh, I can't get creative about it. There's obviously some kind of a tree over here, but it's, it's creating a swath across the landscape. So there's really no guide. So this is something we'll have to do by feel. And so you can see that it depends on the background image. And so I've given you a bunch of sample background images. You can pick your own. Any of, any of them are perfectly acceptable. So let's jump back to my first streetscape here. So here's my streetscape. I have essentially the angle that's representing my shadow. I have the horizon line established. I have a few layers. These were all layers that I drew or shapes that I drew as part of it. Let me select those and delete those so that we're clear. All right, so I have a background image that's locked. And for right now, it can stay locked. Doesn't matter. I'm not doing any editing on the background image. I have a shape 4 and a shape 5. Those, sorry, there we go. Those both represent these two angles that I've drawn. I drew those angles using the line tool which is hidden underneath the rectangle tool, if you decide you want to draw them. Uh, I changed the color to red, and I also changed the weight to 10 pixels so they'd be a little thicker. For you guys, you can keep the, the pixels smaller because you're on your screen, you can see them. When we're looking at the projector, you need a thicker line to, to see it. So I have those two together. I'm going to go ahead and merge those two shapes together. So I'll select them both, holding down Shift. I'll right click, and I'll go to Merge Shapes. And when I do that, they become one shape instead of two separate lines. And that's just so that I can use it as a reference down the road. And I'll come back to that. So the next piece is actually finding a person that belongs in the scene. And so you guys isolated a bunch of people as part of your, your, your work last class. You can, of course, use one of your own people. If you don't like your own people, you can go into the resources section. You can go into collage images. And you can start drilling down. We can look at people. Right? And we could look at a variety of people. So let me click on this first person here, maybe. Right? So there's a person. Now when I look at this person, I want to think about, well, where's the shadow? Where's the light? Oops. Let me, let's look at just the color version. So in order for her to integrate into the scene, I have to have an understanding of what's the shadow and what's the light look like on her. So in this case, the shadows are being cast on this side of her body. right? Likewise, this edge of the coat is casting that shadow there. So I can discern a couple things. One, the sun is coming from the left side, not the right side. And it's also fairly high in the sky because of this edge casting that shadow there. So this person may work for the scene. Let me jump back here. It may work nicely for this scene because the sun's pretty high. The problem is that in this scene, the sun is obviously coming from the right, though I could flip her the opposite direction, but it's also from slightly behind. So if that was the case, she would need to be more in shadow. So it's not really the best pick. Can you make it work with, with somebody like this? Sure. It's just not quite as good. And so you want to try to think through that uh, as you select your images. So I'll keep looking rather than settling on her, and I'll see if I can find somebody else that would work as part of this scene. So 
kind of get previews here. Let's look at this one for a second. All right, similar in the shadows, but she's a little bit more in, in, uh, in shadow. So this one might work for that scene. And obviously she's walking away, and I don't know whether that's what I want as part of the scene, etc. So I have some that I've already downloaded as part of it, so you don't have to watch me trying to pick the right image. Recognize that picking the right image could take 10 minutes of looking at images. You will get far better results if you take your time and find the right person to put in the scene, rather than just throwing a person into the scene. And I think that's one of the things that happens all too often when people do Photoshop, especially people who are inexperienced with Photoshop, is they just say, oh, well, this is the first person I found. Let me stick her into the scene, or stick him into the scene. If you take your time and you find the right background, and you find the right person, you'll get far better results. So let me go ahead and look at my flash drive here. Under today's exercises. And I have an elements uh, folder. And I'm going to look at these two people. Okay, so in this case, I have a shadow being cast down. The sun would be on the right. I have sun in, f you know, shining on the person. This feels like it might work okay for my first scene, my street scene. Those are the two that I'm going to work with. So let me go back to Photoshop and let me open up that first street scene. There it is. And I'm going to go ahead and bring those two people into the scene. So I'll go to File, and then Place. And I'll take those two people, and I'll place them into the scene. Now, when they first drop into the scene, obviously they, they look like giants. Not going to work. So this is where that horizon line trick happens. Generally speaking, without any special hills or you know, stairs or special circumstances, as long as the camera was shot at eye level, Typically, people in the scene are going to roughly have their eyes at about eye level. So if I shrink these people down, and I'm going to hold down Shift as I do this, and I place them so that their average eye level, we can assume that maybe he's a little taller, she's a little shorter, their average eye level is right at about the horizon line, they're going to feel like, okay, they're actually standing there and walking. If I want them deeper into the scene, I can shrink them a little bit more and drop their eye level. And you can kind of see this happen. There's a sweet spot. There they look too small. There they look too big. Right there, they feel like they kind of belong in the scene. And so let me move them over a little bit, maybe like that. Obviously, you want to think about general rules of composition. Where do you want your people to be? You know, this is a one-point perspective with strong diagonals. So having these people break the strong diagonal it probably works nicely. Also, I want to think about you know, where they're stepping. You know, should she be right on top of that track? Should she be slightly over so that they're walking on either side of the track? That might be a, a little bit nicer. So you just think about how people actually would be walking there. All right, so they're set. Their height is relatively set. I'm going to use the arrow keys to nudge them down just a little bit so that they kind of nest into the scene. So I've got their size correct. I'm using that horizon line as a guide. And I'll go ahead and confirm my changes by clicking the little check mark up here at the top. And when I've done that, okay, now they feel like they're part of the scene because their size is correct. But if we look just at their feet for a second, right, their feet very much feel like they're floating rather than being part of the scene. So we have to deal with getting their feet on the ground. And we need to do something to do that. So the easiest way in this context is to create a shadow for these people. So you remember last class I had you cut out the colored people, but I also had you make a silhouette of the people. There's a reason that I always make you do stuff, right? You'll learn this in time. So if I go into File and then Place and I find the shadow or the silhouette of these people, we can drop that into this scene. So obviously I have to make it smaller. I'll hold down Shift. We'll make this a little smaller. And I'm going to make it the same size as these people, roughly. Let's be a little bit bigger, about like that. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. So now I have the shadow of these two people. Let me bring back my little angular guide for just a second. And I'm going to use the Move tool with the angular guide. Make sure I'm on just Shape 5 layer. And we'll move that over 
to get kind of the happy medium where we've got their feet and we've got their shadow. Right? It looks like it needs to be a little bit longer. It's about like that. I can use this then as a guide for how their shadow is cast on the ground. So obviously their shadow isn't there yet, but let's go ahead and take this shadow, change the blending mode of the shadow to be multiply, which is gonna darken things in the scene. And actually, let me go ahead and rename this shadow for clarity. Or I guess it could be people one shadow if you were putting more than one person in the scene. Then I'm gonna come up to the edit tool and I'm gonna go to transform, oops, sorry, I have to have shadow selected here. I'm gonna go to edit, transform, and then skew. We have a few other options. We have warp and perspective, which can work if you're trying to, to cast the shadow on a curving surface. We're gonna stick with straight shadows for right now. I think skew is the easiest to work with. And so now what skew is, is it lets me have control of the shadow in the upper corners. So I have to work my way down in the scene. And you can see as I do this, we're getting the shadows to fall. Obviously they're starting to fall in plane, which is good, but the shadows really need to, to work themselves around a bit more. So I'll keep working. And part of the reason that I like skew is it helps you control what's happening to the shadows in a more defined manner. And it will only let you move in one direction at once, which is useful. So I'll work my way around. And I also have to come back and revisit where the shadows match up. See, as I started that skew, they've stopped being attached to the feet anymore. So we have to move them back so that they start to be attached to the feet. This shoe is slightly off the ground. Likewise, her shoe is slightly off the ground. We're looking for a happy medium there. We may need to adjust the skew here a little bit as well to make sure that those points line up with their feet. Let me go back, control minus. And I still have to go a little bit further around, more like that, more like that. And I also still need those shadows to be a bit longer. So let's stretch out the shadow. Remember that his head should roughly follow that little guide there. Does that make sense how I'm using all, all of those to try to establish where it is? Let me turn off the guide for a second so we can see just the, oh, I'm going to have to commit to the, the skew. And I can turn off the guide now. And you can see that this shadow is falling just like the rest of the shadows in the scene. There's a few problems, and that is that the, the, the shadow goes through his foot. So let's change the order so that the people layer is on top of the shadow layer. There we go. And so that shadow isn't, isn't cutting through anymore. The other factor in this is that the shadow isn't quite the same color as the other shadows in the scene. So I can adjust that by going to the opacity and change, oops, wrong, wrong layer. I can go to shadow and I can adjust the opacity a little bit to more closely match the opacity of the shadows in the scene. Probably a little bit less. And yeah, maybe like that. The tone of the shadow is also different. I had a neutral gray. The tone of these shadows is a little bit more blue. I'm gonna go ahead and add a channel mixer adjustment layer. So let me go to adjustment layer. Uh, let me not do it. Let me do, I'm trying to think whether I want, let me try a color balance and see. See if I can adjust the color balance a little bit more blue. Oop. So you notice when I did that, and I skewed that over, it adjusted the whole image. I want this color balance to apply only to the shadow. So if I have the color balance layer selected and I press Control, Alt, and G, it will tie it just to the layer directly below it. There's no way of finding that in the menu. It's just something you have to memorize, Control, Alt, G. And so now, as I adjust it, it's only going to change the blue value of the shadow. And so you can see, there it is, a little bit more yellow. There it is, a little bit more blue. So I've adjusted the shadow to match up with the way that the scene looks. Okay, so once I have the shadow established into the scene, you can see that the people no longer feel like they're floating because they're casting a shadow on the ground. 
And so if we look in here, you know, there's probably a little bit of fine tuning that I could do in terms of how these actually fall at the ground. Maybe a little bit, um, I could even come in here with the eraser tool and be on the shadow layer here. Ah, I have to rasterize this layer. It's a smart object still. So if I right click, I could say rasterize layer, and then I could just touch up a little bit of those shadows so that they're tied more directly to their feet. Small, subtle, but a little bit of a change. So I found a way to get these people to feel like they're part of the scene. It may be necessary to do a little bit of extra dodging and burning to these people to darken up some areas of them, so don't forget about that. I can go back to my layer, new layer. Dodge and burn. Overlay, fill with a neutral 50% gray. I want this to only apply to the people layer. So again, control alt G. I get the little arrow which ties it just to the people layer. And I can come in with my dodge and burn. Let's make this a little bit smaller. And we could darken up a little bit of their shadows. Just a little bit smaller. The other thing that's possible is that those people are a little bit too color saturated for this particular scene. So I may adjust the saturation of, of these people just a little bit. So let me do one more adjustment layer, layer, new adjustment layer, a hue and saturation adjustment. Again, I want it to tie directly to the layer below, which it is. And I could then drop the uh, saturation of those people down just a little bit to whatever feels like it belongs as part of the scene. So you see there's all these little tricks that you can do along the way. And really what today is about is being able to put the people in and to get the shadow to work. The other tricks are bonuses. And if you feel like trying them out, by all means, try them out. So putting these people in is relatively simple. We've got them, we've got their shadow. If I dropped a person in, I'm gonna drop another person in for a second. We go to file and then place. I drop her in. If I look at her, the shadow's on this side of her, the sun's on that side of her, so I need her to be the opposite direction. So I can flip her over, and now the sun's going in the right direction. I could also go to Edit, Transform, Flip, I think it's horizontal, yeah, so that I don't accidentally skew her. And then let's, again, she doesn't need to be that big of a giant. Let's make her a little bit smaller. Drop her further back into the scene. So that maybe she's crossing the street like that. And I'll go ahead and say OK. Same rules of shadows apply. I can go to File and then Place. Let me go back to Edit, Transform, Flip Horizontal. So, oops. Edit transform. Come on. I was supposed to say flip horizontal. There we go. Oops, a little small. There we go. I have to make her shadow work. So let's take both of these. We commit to it. These should be on top of the dodge and burn layer. There we go. And I need to take her shadow and change it to be a multiply. Wrong layer, sorry. This is why naming your layers makes sense. So, And let me go to multiply. There we go. And now I need to start my skew process. So let me go ahead and go to um, edit, transform, skew. And I'm going to do the same thing with her shadow.
And this definitely does take practice to get the, the shadow to look right. But I'm running into a problem here as I do this. Let me zoom in for a second. And that is that I can cast a shadow on the ground, but I have a curb. So if the shadow goes up on the curb, it wouldn't a actually look like that. So I need a little bit more time to tweak her shadow. So bear with me a little bit. Let's get it around a little bit further. There you go. So the shadow's looking OK. We'll drop it back a little bit. It probably needs to be a little bit longer. So we'll stretch it out just a little bit, say like that. And it breaks because it should be hitting the curb and going up and over. So I'll go ahead and confirm it for just a second. And then I need to come in with my selection. And I like to use the polygonal lasso tool here, which is underneath the regular lasso. And I need to know where this hits the curb. So it would hit the curb right about there, the lower curb. And so we'll go ahead and we'll go around it so that it's a little selection. Then I can use the Move tool. And I can move this, oops, supposed to cut it. Ah, it's still a smart object. I have to rasterize it. So let me right click on the shadow again. Let me rasterize layer. That embeds it into the scene. Now I can use the Move tool. And it will cut out that piece of the shadow. And I can drop it up to the top of the curb. So I have that. Obviously, I need to connect those two pieces in the shadow. So we can use my, rect or my uh, polygonal lasso to go there. Oops. There's my selection. I need to paint it, but I need that color. So I'll use the eyedropper tool, which is right here, to select that particular color of gray. There it is. I could also type in. We know it's 75% gray, so we could just type it in. And I'll use my paintbrush, and we'll paint that little bit of shadow in. And now we have the shadow being cast on the ground, up there, and then over. It looks like I wasn't quite precise enough in this. Uh, and it also looks like maybe my gray was a little bit too dark. Um, so I'll, I'll go back and fix that. But you guys, I wanted to at least introduce you to the concept of something happens in the scene. We could also look here at that particular piece of shadow. And given the way the curb works, the shadow actually casts, comes up, and goes back, and then over. So it may take a little bit of extra to work to make that feel like it's part of the scene. But you do want to pay attention to what's being cast and what it's being cast on. So let me go ahead and go Control-0 so we can see the overall scene. And I would perform the same kinds of adjustments to that shadow that I did to this shadow to make them feel like they're part of the scene. Let me move over into the field setup. And I actually, I think I'm going to do this field. I, the, this one's a little bit more fun, I think. And so I'm going to go ahead and place a person in this, in this field. We know that the, the sun is coming from the right, shining to the left, but we don't know the precise placement of it. Let me go ahead and go to File, and then Place. And let's see what I can find here. Let's go ahead. I don't have a shadow for him. I'm missing shadows. Let me go back. I'll do this one. So I need her. So let me save this image as. Maybe. Come on. There we go. And let's put it into today's folder. But I also need the shadow. There it is. And let's go ahead and put her into the scene. So I'll go to File and then Place. And so the same rules apply here, where I want her to end up falling on a particular, her eye level needs to be roughly at that horizon line. And then I have to decide where she fits in the scene. Do I want her walking on the path? You know, So maybe the path is, is a good strategy, something like that. That could work. I could also have her standing out in the middle of the field. I'm going to do her over here because the shadow will be a little bit more challenging to do. 
So there she is as part of the scene. I'll go ahead and commit to it. I'll zoom in a bit, and we can see her. Now again, the feet feel like they're completely floating on top of this. But let's get the shadow in and see what happens. So I'll go to File, and then Place. And I'll take her shadow, and I'll drop her shadow into this scene as well. I'll hold down Shift to shrink her shadow. All right, that's about right. So I know the shadow is being cast down. Let's make sure that this is a multiply. And then let's go ahead and change the edit transform skew. And let's drop our shadow down. And the editing of shadows and figuring out how these controls work does take some practice. OK, so let me adjust that a little bit. And I think it needs to go down just a little bit more and over just a little bit more. Yeah, right about like that, something like that. So I'm, I'm adjusting it for it. Maybe it needs to be a little bit flatter, but we're, we're getting into the approximate. I'll go ahead and say OK. So as I look at her, the shadow exists, but it doesn't really ground her feet yet. And so this is where we run into a problem when we get grass. And this is why grassy fields and stuff are more complicated, is when we stand in grass, there's grass that's in front of us, and there's grass that's behind us, and our feet are kind of nested in it. And in this case, it's long grass. So we need a way of mimicking that as part of both our shadow and our person. So let's start with just the person for a, for, for a second. And what I'll do is I need a piece of the background that is right over her feet. So with the background layer selected, I'm going to draw with the rectangular marquee a, a selection. I'll go to Edit, and then Copy, and then Edit, and Paste. And so I end up with a second version of the ground there. Okay, So let's go ahead and cut out so that her feet are, uh, are cut out as part of this. Right now it's just a solid rectangle. So I'll use magic wand. And I'll select, oops, let me make sure I'm on her. And I'll select everything but her. I'll do a select inverse so it is just her that's selected. I'll move to my cutout grass, and I'll press Delete. And what that gives me is a cutout in her shape on the grass. Okay. Now that I have that, I'm going to use something called the clone stamp. And it's right here. It looks like a rubber stamp. And so the way a rubber stamp works, right? you guys have all used rubber stamps, is you have an ink pad, you take the rubber stamp, you stamp it in, and then you put it over here. The clone stamp essentially does the same thing. The ink stamp, the ink pad, is somewhere else in the scene, and you're putting that color where you want it. So we'll use this clone stamp tool, and we're going to pick from our brushes, rather than our typical round brush, we're going to come down here, and there's a brush called 134. It's a grass brush. So we'll pick the grass brush. And with the grass brush selected, we're going to adjust the size a little bit. It's at 100 right now. I'll have to see. In order to copy from or to designate where you're copying from, you hold down the Alt key, and you click somewhere else in the scene. So I'll click right here. And then as I come over here, there's my little brush. It's going to draw grass over the lady's feet. And it's copying from over here to over here. So we'll keep going just a little bit. We'll cover that up. Nice. We'll turn her back on and drop her below that layer. And now she's starting to feel like she's standing in the field rather than standing on top of the field. So now we have to do the same thing with the shadow. The shadow right now feels like it's just 
on top of the scene. It's not really casting a, a good shadow for us. So we need to fake the edge of the shadow as well. This one's a little bit different. So when we do this, we're going to start on the shadow layer itself. Let me turn off the other layers for just a second. And we're going to rasterize this layer so we can actually work with it. So let me go to uh, rasterize layer so it's not a smart object. We're going to use the clone stamp brush, but we're going to copy from, I have to make this a little smaller, we're going to copy from the gray and we're going to make the upper edge of her shadow have these little grass brush pieces. And part of the challenge here is the shadow is so narrow that we're not getting a good copy. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a temporary place to copy from. And I'll paint that in in this same gray color. And we'll go back to my clone stamp. And when I copy from, I'll hold down Alt and click from down here. And then when I do the grass brush, oh, come on. These two have to be merged. Copy from here up to there. Come on. Really? Got to love it when stuff doesn't do what you're supposed to do, right? Come on. Hold on a second. Sorry. See, it happens to me, too. So the reason it's not doing it is I have a selection down there. So let me get rid of my selection. Then I can zoom in. And this is certainly the most advanced part of what I'm trying to show you today. Let me hold down Alt with the clone stamp. I'm copying from here. And now I can copy the grass on the upper side of the shadow. So ignore the lower side of the shadow for just a second. When we turn back on the scene, oops, this has to be multiply, you can see that the grass is making a shadow on that upper layer. I need the opposite to happen on the front of this. So instead of painting in the the gray that I was painting in, I need to paint in white now. So let me press Control minus. This needs to become a white square. I'll paint in white this time. I'll go back to my clone stamp. And let me zoom in here. I'm going to hold down Alt to copy from here. And then I'm going to do the front edge in white. And you see that the shadow is not nearly as defined as it is on pavement. But if you think about a shadow in a grassy field, it's not nearly as defined because the gray blades of grass are covering it up, etc. So I do the front edge in white, like that. And now if I were to turn on the background, the shadow is being cast into the grass as part of the person. So when I zoom out, she's a lot smaller. It's harder to see. I think I lost my, I don't know how I managed that one. I lost my cover of her foot. So bear with me for one second to do that again. Let me go to edit, copy, and then edit, paste. Put that one on top. Magic wand to select the background, oops, on her. Select the background. There we go. Select inverse. No. Switch to that. Delete. There we go. Now that I have that piece, I can go back with the clone stamp with the grass brush. There's the clone stamp. I'm going to copy from here. 
and cover up those feet just a little bit to make them feel like they're part of this grassy field, something like that. I can turn her on, and we can see that, yes, her feet feel like they're part of the field now. I can turn the shadow on. The shadow has to be on top of all the layers so that we can get it. Looks like my shadow is a little bit long. I may need to move that shadow just a bit so that it ends up more like that as part of it. We can turn back on the rest of the background, control zero, and we can see that now she's part of the grassy field. And it feels like her feet are part of the grassy field. So what I want you to do for today, and I know that's a lot to take in in a short amount of time. Okay? Obviously, I've been doing this a lot longer than you have. So I have a lot of practice and I can make this look really easy. It's not. It takes a lot of practice to do it. So what I want you to do is I want you to start with the easy option, which is the street scene, something like this. Doing it on pavement generally is easier. So start with that, get the shadows, figure out how to manipulate it, and then once you get that done, challenge yourself to work through something like this. And if you get the person in the scene with a little grass over her, Great. If you can do the shadow and you can add the shadow in, that's good too. Okay. So again, this is the challenge. This is for the people who breeze through the first half. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to post at least one of these images, hopefully two. This should take you the bulk of the lab time today to at least do one and or part of two. You have two hours to do it, so I would expect you to be here practicing. This is a skill you really need to have when you go forward in your design career. You need to be able to integrate people into a scene such that they feel like they belong because you have to be able to fabricate it. If you think about putting your architectural design, your building, whatever it is, into an existing scene, you have to have these skills to sell it like this is what it's going to look like. And therefore, it's an important skill to have. Okay.